Okay. Great. Good morning, makers, and welcome to Maker Camp, our second annual Maker Camp. Today we're here at the Exploratorium, and we're glad to be bringing you Maker Camp. Maker Camp is a collaboration between Google and Maker Media, and our goal is to inspire millions of makers around the world. In addition to being here today and throughout the next 30 days, Maker Camp will be at libraries and different affiliate sites. So check it out on makercamp.com and go to Make's G Plus page and look forward to a summer of great making. Today I'd like to introduce you to Tom Rockwell. Um, Tom is the Associate Director of Exhibits here at the Exploratorium, and Tom's going to tell us a little bit of great things about it. Here you go. Well, first of all, I want to join in the welcome. We are so excited to have the Maker Camp here, and the Exploratorium is all about making. Exploratorium is about really learning with your hands, learning through what you can do with through building, through making, through experimenting. And so we, we are very enthusiastic supporters of the whole make movement here. I'm standing right now in front of something called the Tinkerer's Clock, which was created for the Tinkering Studio by a collaborator, uh, Tim Hunkin, who's actually an artist in England who actually built this beautiful contraption here. And every hour on the hour, it kind of opens up. And it really is kind of an, an homage, a monument to, to, to makers um, all over the place. In fact, you see little people on the clock itself hammering away. And that really, that really embodies our philosophy of, of learning through making, which is also part of the Tinkering Studio, which is a place at the Exploratorium that is devoted to art, science, and technology through building things with your hand. And we're actually right outside the Tinkering Studio, and we'll go in and explore there a little later on, as well as our shop and outdoors to see things whether they're big or small, that we actually engage in through making here at the Exploratorium. So welcome all. We, this, this place was built by people who love to tinker. From the very beginning, we've built the majority of the exhibits at the Exploratorium here in-house. We don't import them from somewhere else. And we like to think that we've contributed to the Bay Area cult maker culture a great deal as well. So how long have you been here? Been I, here? I, I, I've been, well, in the new home, it's only been about three months, so this is all brand new for us. And in fact, this tinkering studio is really part of our commitment to, to really embracing not just the making makers on staff, but allowing more and more visitors to engage in that kind of making experience. Yep. We'll be going in the tinkering studio in a few moments. We've got some things going on there, but I think what we'd really like to do is we're going to see a little bit of um, have this clock kick it off. And I'm not sure if we can get it pan up to where we are. Well, there you go. Well, officially, we've started Maker Camp. So thank you so much, Tom. And now let's go to the tinkering studio, and we can check, with, check out our camp director, Nick. Hey there, Sherry. Thanks a bunch. So we're here in the, uh, the Tinkering Studio. Uh, we have uh, Nick and Kelly. Uh, they're going to be two uh, Maker Camp counselors, so you see them a lot during the, the summer camp this year. And uh, we're also here with some campers, so uh, hanging out with us. And today we're making paddle boats. So we're going to take you through some steps. And uh, you guys want to grab some parts, and we'll kind of do the build step by step. So we're going to start uh, with the completed one, actually. I can show you. Thank you, Winston. Um, so we're just going to take a couple couple of parts you might have around the house and um, put them together. So you guys want to grab your bottles. Uh, what we'll do, we'll first add the dowels. So we've got some wooden dowels that we have pre-cut. Um, they can be anywhere from about 10 to uh, maybe as short as 6 inches if you wanted. And what you want to do is you want to take some electrical tape or some duct tape, whatever you have around the house, preferably waterproof, and um, take those dowels and put them kind of midway up on the bottle and then wrap them around really tight on that 2 liter bottle. So what we do with those is that is going to be what we use to attach the paddle. And so we'll actually show you in the next couple steps how to make that paddle. Um, so one of the cool things about these projects, Nick, is that um, most of the stuff you have around the house. Yeah. Um, and so for the paddles, you guys at Make Labs, did you do anything special uh, to make some custom paddles, kind of trick it out? You know, we did. We, we played around with some wood ones. And so we have some wood paddles. A rough design here. And then you okay. know, took it a step further. And we actually laser cut one. So we laser cut some paddles? Yeah. Okay. And then after that, you know, we really engineered it. 
and built a, a real paddle. Oh, that's cool. Paddle. So this is like a laser cut uh, multi-piece paddle. Exactly. So you don't have to go this route. Uh, just kind of uh, make labs, kind of checking them out. So maybe we'll try this and for the works. paddle boats. So once we get that tape nice and tight around there, um, we were kind of talking actually before the hangout started, you could also add a second brace. So one in the back towards the rear of the bottle, you could also add a second uh, set of tape in the front and that adds more rigidity to it. Um, we kind of noticed at the, when we're building these, that if you don't support these properly, uh, the dowels, they want to flex in a little bit and they're going to pinch that paddle. So in order to keep those spread nice and wide so that paddle will uh, freely spin, we can add a couple more rounds of uh, electrical tape. Keep it farther apart? Yeah, keep it farther apart. Um, also, one thing for this step, if you guys haven't come across it, is make sure that cap is nice and tight. Um, when you're putting that, that tape around, you don't want the bottle to deflate at all. Um, so that's another good tip. Uh, Nick, what else? You've been building these, and Kelly, did you help build some of these in the labs? Any any tips or tricks for this one, step? One thing with uh, with these paddles, if you're using the coffee can lids, is they tend to be a little bit weak. And if you put a little bit of tape on, if you get a, a weak, oh, okay, one, it uh, it makes it a little bit more rigid and it'll actually make your paddle boat go a little bit faster. So we can reinforce this paddle. Well, Nick, can you show us actually how do you make these paddles uh, with some supplies? We use uh, plastic lids. Yeah. Plastic lids, you want me to make one? For yeah, you? you want to demonstrate it? Um, we can show the campers after they do the, the electric tape. So how's the taping going, everybody? Nicely done. So yeah, the next step after the dowels are on, uh, Nick, we can kind of show over here some, uh, some cutting action. And what you want to do is we have a ruler. You can measure, actually, um, the distance in between those dowels. Usually for a standard water bottle or a soda bottle like this, it's going to be about four three and a half, four inches. Um, and then if you have a Sharpie or a marker and you find some plastic, uh, you can mark out those paddles. Um, and the trick to the paddles is that you actually want to cut two rectangular shapes and then halfway through them you're going to cut in the middle. And so what those do is they kind of slide together. So we had a good point to start the paddles, everybody. Cool. So we'll grab some plastic. Um, you could find uh, coffee lids is what we talked about online in the instructions. Um, what else? Ice cream cartons, uh, some stiff plastics, maybe something in the recycling bin. I found like a really big uh, two gallon jug of water at my house, actually in the side walls. Made some really good paddles. Lots of plastic. Nice. Also wood too, if you're willing to use a saw. Wood, if you guys have some, uh, some wood skills, definitely. So are you guys ready to see how these paddles are made? Okay. So what you want to do is... I'll kind of narrate for you, Nick. So you want to take it and you want to kind of um, draw your straight edge using a marker or something on the plastic. And you want to take that dimension that was in between those dowels and subtract an inch to give yourself some clearance for those rubber bands. So probably about three, three and a half inches would work here. You can measure that with a ruler. Yeah, there you use a ruler. And then you want to make, instead of making and cutting out four different paddles, you actually want to cut out two sets. And so it'll be twice that thickness, so about the size of the lid. Works out pretty well, we found. It's about maybe four and a half, five inches. And then make a second one. Is that the trick? Correct. Okay. Awesome. Looking good. And then once the paddle's done, um, sort of that third feature is going to be the pontoons. And so the pontoons on the side help to stabilize the paddle boat when it's going in the water. Um, for those, you could use, you don't have to, but you can use smaller water bottles. Um, these happen to be like a 500 milliliter water bottles. And again, you just kind of use the same process, use some tape, wrap around the dowels, and those, uh, those provide some extra buoyancy there. So nice. So once you get those two cut... I'm going to cut this one based on the first one. Okay, so you can use the first one that you cut as a template. All right. And then what else? So there's a trick to this part, right, Nick? You have to cut one of them in the middle. Yes. Okay, so we'll show that next. Anybody using the, uh, the cool laser cut paddles? Yeah. All right, we'll see how fast they go. 
And then the shapes of your paddles, they can vary. Uh, you could do uh, just like the laser cut pieces we have here, and just nice straight edges. You could add some, some arcs to them, kind of see what works, what doesn't. Um, another camper wrote in and was asking a question um, on the Google Plus page, and they're asking, you know, what happens if you fill it partially with water? And so, uh, you know, kind of sink it lower into the water. Would that add some weight to it? Would it add some drag? So kind of experiment, see what happens. Maybe you can make a submarine out of it if it was uh, deep enough. All right. Good so far. So you want to have these lines here. So here's kind of the trick to the paddle, if you guys can see it. Um, up here, Nick's got two of the same essentially cut, and we're going to cut halfway through each of the paddles, just, just halfway through. Can we raise them up a little bit? And then they kind of will slide into each other. Is that right? Okay, cool. Some scissors. And then again, you don't have to just use uh, water bottles and soda bottles. You know, you could try other things, maybe like a juice jug, something plastic. It'll close, has a cap. Um, check out that uh, dynamics of the bottle itself. So in here, Nick, can you kind of show? There you go. Just there you go. Slide There's... them together here. There go. Awesome. So that's how you make your paddle. And then you can reinforce it with the tape. If you have some extra tape lying around, they're kind of, kind of wobbly. So has anyone built a paddle boat before? Campers? I know Nick has, Kelly has. Maybe, okay. There's the wood paddle going on there. We'll yeah, check that out. It's gonna work really well. <laughs> It'll work really well, right? Yeah, depending on how you can cut it with the saw. Use And so once you have the paddle, we're going to use the rubber bands. Uh, a couple of the campers already have the rubber bands put on there. We can show the camera. Um, basically, you can use one or two, or you could use two or more rubber bands to kind of trap the paddle in place in between those dowels. Um, maybe we can show yours in front of the up top in front of the camera. See how that rubber band action goes. All right. And you want you know about three or four inches away from those dowels, just enough to have some clearance. So you can move them. And then once you have the paddles on, because you guys are pretty, pretty far ahead, you can just start adding that, uh, the pontoons uh, using those 500 millimeter, um, milliliter uh, water bottles. Um, again, just like the, the first water bottle, just kind of wrap it around the dowels um, nice and tight. I'm going to add some buoyancy. And then once we get a couple of those ready, we'll, uh, we'll have a little race. Here's the... So then here, thanks Nick, here is the um, sort of reinforced paddle. Uh, you can see you add some more electrical tape, um, give some stiffness to it so it won't flex as much when you, when you bend it. Nice job, Nick. Thank you. All right, looking good, looking good. So we'll have a couple boats to race pretty soon. And so, Kelly, any other tips for tools or things you could try out? Uh, um, I just think the big thing is support with your paddle, you know? Yeah. Um, really make sure that you actually get a fast boat instead of something that kind of just spuds there by itself. Okay. Does it matter kind of how it sits in the water? Have you guys seen from experiments what um, works best? I think when it's a little tilted, you know, on its back end, a little more, it seems like it helps. You know, okay. How it really gets in the water, so. Okay. You know, Nick, one thing you can do with these is you can adjust the water bottles to put the boat lower or higher oh, in the water and okay. then you can adjust how much the paddle spins and that can adjust your speed or your range and if you go a little bit faster or you can go a little bit farther than okay. what you want. That's a That's great right. tip. Yeah. A little bit, a little customize. Exactly. Yeah, so you can build it, kind of test it and tweak it. Yeah. Okay. So then to do you want to show what do you have to do, Nick, to actually get this in the water and to use it? So how do you wind up the paddle and whatnot? Well, you wind it the opposite way of, of how you want it to spin. So okay. If you want it to spin forward, then you'd have to wind it backwards. Okay. So you just wind it up, you know, you can start with something small, maybe 10 turns or so. And kind of see what happens that first time. Exactly. We'll experiment. Yeah. Okay. You would even do a dry run and just let it spin. Okay. Nice. You know? Yeah. And then 
Then there's cool. uh, once it's pulled back, you just set in the water. Would you like to? Um, you know what? We're actually going to keep on building. We're going to cut to the uh, to M, I believe, and we're going to go uh, pass off the bugle. Okay. So uh, I'll give this to you, Nick, and campers keep going, and we'll do some races uh, maybe at the end when we get back. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Cut. All right, there you go, dude. Hey, Adam, how's it going, man? You don't need internet. Yeah, likewise. So it, it's seen a web server. This is awesome. Yeah, have you been here before? This is my second time. Second time? Really cool. I yeah. haven't even had a chance to do you know, half of the things that are here. Yeah. Some you know. new stuff, some old stuff. Right. Have cool. you, did you go to the Exploratorium a lot when you were here? Yeah, kid? you know, actually last year we got a back behind the scenes tour. It was pretty cool. <laughs> see their workshop and see all the new projects they had and then kind of in the process they were packing up. So uh, it's really awesome to see it here. Totally. Kind of all unveiled. Yeah, man. It's great. Yeah. Well, so Maker Camp 2013, year all two. All right. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. We got all kinds of things going on. We're visiting uh, NASA, Pixar, yeah. all kinds of places. Some got good field trips. Exactly. Some Maybe. good weekend projects coming yeah. up on the Fridays. Skill builders. Skill builders. Can you, what's that about? So, skill builders are basically, you know, the essential skills that you need to be a maker, right? Okay. Makes so sense. things like soldering, um, you know, what do you got? Woodworking skills Woodworking, or something. Right? Yeah, 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 like the basic tools and the, the skills you need. Exactly. Well, awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to say, as last year's camp director, uh, as, the, as the tradition goes here at Maker Camp, yeah, we, uh, we pass on the honorary bugle, the to, bugle. The, to that year's camp director. So uh, I've never been very good at trumpet horn playing myself, yeah. but I can certainly try uh, as, the, as the tradition goes. Yeah. So we'll try it. All right, here we go. Oh. Nailed it. All right, congratulations, man. Congrats, man. Thank you. There you All go. right, well, I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Cheers. Let's go uh, have a little chat with Nicole, who's going to show us the workshop here at the Exploratorium. Hi, Nicole. Hi. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Shall we take a look at your, your workshop here? Yeah, so this is the Exploratorium Machine Shop. Uh, this is where we build and design and test everything. Um, I most recently have been working on a yeah. sign. What is this? So these are 16 segment LEDs, and I decided to go very analog with this. I wanted right. to make a sign for our tinkering studio. That's so, really cool. Yeah, so close in. Nice, open. that's so cool. <laughs> and you could have done this with an Arduino. I could have. But, but you decided to be really awesome and do it all by hand. Yeah, I wanted people to be able to see how it worked. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Should we check out some of the tools you have here in the workshop? Sure. Um, nice. So uh, this shop is set up to make just a huge range of things, okay. um, from a fog bridge to a, tr a slinky treadmill. Nice. You, know, you need a lot of different tools. Um, right. This is a milling machine. And a lot of our, our tools that we've had for a long time are um, like World War II surplus. Yeah. And I think, I'm not sure if this is one. Definitely the lathes are. Um, this is a great tool if you have to do some really precision uh, machining. Totally. And um, just recently, we got the new computerized version of this oh, machine. Oh, CNC, huh? Yeah, so this awesome. is a CNC mill. Cool. Um, so and what kind of things do you build here in the shop? At, so we, we build every exhibit you'll see on the floor we built in here. It's all built in-house. Yeah, all built in-house, all designed in-house. Um, we prototype, we test, we, we fix them. Wow. Just, this is like the, the heart of the Exploratorium. That's awesome. So, That's really cool. And again, because there's such a huge range of things that we make, yeah. uh, you need a wide variety of tools. So this is our smallest drill bit. Nice. It's nice tiny. Drill. And this... This is our largest. Holy moly. <laughs> so there's quite a range of, of tooling available to you guys. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Nice. Hold right on. Should we take a look at maybe, what's the, is this a, a mill? What is this? Uh, so these are, these are, are lathes. lathes. Yeah. Right. Um, exactly. These, these are World War II surplus and um, they're really great if you need to make anything round. Right. Um, and basically the way it works is it spins your piece and the drill bit stays still. So um, it's, good it's for, good for round mm -hmm. objects. Yes. 
machining yeah. round objects. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Oh, you got some drill presses. Um, is, yeah. yeah, so this is this is another mill. Another this, mill. Oh, see. this is actually a brand new tool. It's called an iron worker, and it can cool. uh, punch out holes in like really thick steel. Wow, Very cool. that's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Right on. Well, should we take a look at uh, Open ROV? I think these guys are hanging out. Yeah. How's how's it going? Yeah, I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Right. Right. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I'm David Lang, uh, oh, one of the co-founders of OpenRLB, and this year is Eric. Eric. Oh. Hey. Nice How to you doing? Good to see you. How's it going? <laughs> awesome. So you guys uh, do ROVs. Do. Open ROVs. Open source. Yeah. ROV stands for remote vehicle. That can mean any sort of thing that, that you drive that. around from a faraway place. But in our case, we're oh, talking yeah. about submarines. Our robots right. go underwater. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, video cameras too. Yeah. So it's got this video camera on it, and you can see what the video camera sees. Actually, do you want to do you want to see one? Sure. Well, first, actually, yeah. I think we should talk about how we how we got started. Uh, it's yeah. Actually, a pretty good. Oh, story. that's true. That's a there good story. Go. We'll we'll give you a little yeah. suspense. What's here. the story? So basically, here's here's what happened. Um, uh, a while ago, a few years ago, a buddy of mine told me this story, and it was just amazing. Basically, in the 1800s, there was a gold robbery. You know, settlers yeah. were settling. And um, these guys made away with an estimated 100 pounds of gold after robbing these guys. And wow. they were trying to get away from the sheriff's posse. The posse, um, you know, was close behind them. So they ditched the gold and trying to make an escape. And nice. um, eventually the posse caught up with them and said, tell us where you hid the gold and we'll spare your lives. And the guy said they hid it in this cave, this underwater cave way up in the mountains. Wow. And um, the story goes that they went to the back of this cave and they found this puddle and this hole in it that goes straight down as far as anyone can see. And um, over the years, people have tried scuba diving down uh, to get to the bottom, and no one's found the end of it. No yeah. one knows where this gold is or what's at the bottom of the cave. So we designed this open ROV to go explore it. That's what I started doing it for. And then wow. I told David about it. So I met Eric a few years ago, and he's told me this really awesome story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then he wanted to build this robot to go explore, and I was just totally hooked. I didn't Oops. have any experience at the time. I didn't really know my <laughs> way around the shop. But um, we showed up at Tech Shop and started just making stuff. We started taking uh, Very cool. The tools that we use. Yeah. The, uh, Let's pick up the laser. Laser. Yeah. This is one of the main tools that goes into making an ROV. And I don't know if you can see this with the glare, but what's actually happening is a laser is going around this piece of acrylic plastic and cutting out the different parts that we need. Very um, cool. The benefit of using this is we're, we're going to change our design. You know, we're not set with some of these right. different tools. And when we're all oh, done, that's a finished the whole kind of snaps together into this into this underwater robot. Very cool. And to be, you know, to be perfectly honest and totally clear, it's this is not a product of just Eric and I. You know, we have right. this community on OpenROV.com of thousands of people now who are contributing to the design. So it's all open source. So you can go online right now and download the files and cut it, Very cut cool. it out yourself. And so we've got one working now, and oh, wow. we can even show you what yeah. in water. But basically, um, it's got lights, and I can control those lights. And it even has scaling lasers. So these lasers are 10 centimeters apart. And so I can see how big something is. And then the back, it has these thrusters. So when I move the remote control, you can see the thrusters spin. And I can see what the video looks like right here. So you can see here, there's our camera guy, and you can see him right in front of the... So with these tools... The lasers like that. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And so this is a tool that allows us to see something we'd never be able to see before. And, I mean, tons of people would build it. Like, yeah, Zach, exactly. He's pretty cool. You guys inspired a, a young maker here, yeah, Zach. You want to show us your, your ROV? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, let's bring it up. Oh, on up. This is cool. So where'd you get this? Did you design it yourself? Uh, no, I don't have one. Awesome. So that's the... And these... The... Nice. Well. Oh, well, See you soon. All right. Well, I think and the fog installation. Oh wow! Hard mic. She's 
this is me. Uh, to that fence. Or, okay. Okay. Uh, Alex, this is the mic. Can you hear it? This is all we have. Okay. All right, hey guys, we're having some technical difficulties with our audio, and we'll be right back. Uh, we're going to try to fix our audio, get an extended line out to the fog installation. Uh, and we'll be right back. All right. Yeah, OK. All right, guys. Um, let's see. Where's David and Eric? Can we get David and Eric? All right, well, we're having some technical difficulties. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, hang out for just a second here. Uh, you know, so this is an epilogue laser cutter. These things are fantastic. Uh, I w personally wish I had one myself. Uh, yeah, you could do so many different things. You can cut wood. These guys are cutting acrylic. So pretty much any design you want, you can, you know, make it out of a flat piece of something. So, yeah. Um, so right now we're, we're having some technical difficulties, but in just a second... You might hear dead air for a second, but here we go. Yeah. All right, guys, we are back with a microphone that should work great and we're gonna talk to all right, talk to Tom he's gonna tell us about this wonderful fog installation here uh, why don't you uh, tell us about this Tom? okay well so this here behind us is one of the great things about being being on Pier 15 uh, in front of the, the new exploratorium at Pier 15 on the, on the Embarcadero allows us to do art pieces that not only fit on tabletops or in galleries but actually fill the whole environment. So, so, so this is the art piece by um, Fogbridge. It's, called, it's by Fujiko Nakaya who, who is a Japanese artist who's been doing fog sculptures her whole life. And, and she really wanted to kind of give a love poem to San Francisco's fog by creating this environment and our visitors love it. And believe me, this was an interesting challenge to figure out how to do it. And you watch it right now and in fact, the, all the nozzles have just turned off so you're going to see the fog disappearing slowly as, you, as, as it turns off. So the visitors can see it for a while and then it comes back every half an hour. Yeah. Uh, where's the artist from? The artist is from Japan, Fujiko Nakaya. Her, her, her father was actually a, a scientist who studied snow crystals, and that got her interested, but she became an artist instead. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for, uh, thanks for telling us about that installation and showing us around. Okay. All right, we're going to take a look over at this uh, water section, hopefully. Is that, is that Roberto from Oru Kayak over there? I think that is. Can we say hi to Roberto? <laughs> Maybe we can get a shot of Roberto there in the Oru kayak. Hi, Roberto. How's it going, man? So, yeah, Roberto uh, is one of the designers of the Oru kayak, which is actually a foldable kayak pretty unique. Uh, I just lifted it up. It weighs 20 pounds, which is pretty amazing. Super durable. Um, I kind of 
kick the tires, so to speak, and it's it's definitely durable and uh, usable for uh, quite a few years. So uh, Roberto is going to come up in just a few minutes, and when he does, we're going to talk about that. But right now, we're going to talk to David and Eric. They're going to show us how the ROV works. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be fair to just show you guys the ROV on land without actually putting it in the water. So we figured we'd just pull it out here and uh, throw it into the bay. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'll warn you, I don't think there's really going to be much to see. The bay has really bad uh, visibility, visibility, but yeah. um, you know, we can drive it around a little bit anyway. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. Right. All right. Hey, David, you want to come over and, and talk to well, Eric uh, Mansad? So yeah, David is uh, half of Open ROV, yep. and uh, looks like we're Eric's putting the better half. Oh yeah, looks like we're putting the ROV in the water now. You want to give us a little play-by-play -play here? Yeah. So we're about, I would say, ten to 15 feet off the water. So what Eric is doing right now is actually just lowering the ROV down into the water just with that the thin tether. So that, that tether is actually what sends the live video back to your laptop. Um, and is, as you can see, he lowered it down. So it's a very strong um, kind of, in case you lose control of the ROV, you can always bring it back by the tether. So it's another yeah. bit of having That's a having strong the piece of wire there. And so very I can't cool. really see, but it looks like he's driving it around. So he almost hit the piling and now he's steering around it. Awesome. Um, but you can see it's got those those three thrusters that we pointed out earlier. So it helps it turn left and right and move up and down. Um, and you can see it's kind of diving, descending below the water. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. And especially cool when you're diving at night, you can turn the lights on. Um, it, it looks very, very cool. Hey, David, That's how great. deep can that go? So I wonder, can we see any any footage there? Is it too bright, you think? The screen? There's not much to see right now. It looks yeah. like a lot of green. Uh, right. I'm turn on the lights to see if I can um, that's the, see particles in the water, but I can't even really see that. That's, that's the San Francisco Bay for you. Right. right. Wow. Looks pretty maneuverable. It is. It's very, it's very stable in the water. Yeah, it's kind of surprising for, for something that's uh, water-based, you know? Well, we've, we've worked long and hard to, to make it that way. The first yeah. couple of prototypes, you know, um, weren't weren't as good. So we've it's evolved. The design has evolved. And that's like anything with making is the first the first couple iterations might not work perfectly. But if you keep at it and you keep working, um, you eventually get to something that works. That. And now this one is it's pretty exciting. That's really cool. So it's got three motors, uh, one right. for up and down thrust. Yep. One that helps it go up and down. Right. And the other two are what push it forward and backward and then steer it left and right. right. Yeah. So, so what cool. what's it got for uh, battery power? So we've got six lithium batteries on board um, that give it anywhere between two and four hours of of runtime, and they're rechargeable. So um, you know, as soon as you you know finish your dive, you can pull them out, recharge the batteries, and go back for more. Nice, cool. And one thing that really is exciting is that you know we've built this kind of as a general thing that works for exploring the deep, but um, anyone can turn into a different type of project um, because it has onboard batteries and a computer. You can make it an autonomous robot, for instance, yeah. and program it to go on a mission for you. Or you could add your own sensors or gadgets or gadgets that you think would be cool to put down underwater. Yeah. yeah. So um, what are you guys using for processing power, microprocessor wise? Oh, it's really cool. It's actually got a full BeagleBone computer on it. It's a little computer that runs Linux and um, so with that, we can um, we can really do a lot. And it also has a little uh, chip that basically has like an Arduino processor on it. So if you know how to program Arduino, even with that, you can um, kind of get started with programming the robot. It's really got um, the kind of stuff where you can be a beginner and uh, also the kind of stuff where if you're really advanced at programming, you can yeah. still have fun with it. Yeah. So we've got 100 meters of tether. So this thing can go 100 meters deep. Wow. Um, and you, so that gives you quite a bit of distance yeah. and, and depth as well. It's just, yeah. A lot of people are usually. It's really cool. So, what are some interesting applications that uh, makers have put this to use? Oh on? man, there's so much. Remember, David, just the other day there was uh, this guy, Evan Clark, uh, along with um, a friend of his uh, from Stanford. They did this thing. Stanford at Sea. They went into uh, the Palmyra Atoll in the middle of the Pacific, and they drove their ROV in this atoll. And we just got video back um, of him swimming with these melon-headed whales. Wow. This huge pod of whales swim in front of the ROV. Uh, there's a guy in New York who's been exploring all these different little lakes around. Um, there's people in 
uh, tons of countries across the world who, and we're just now starting to get these videos back. It's really exciting. That's I think the so most cool. exciting stuff is going to be what we haven't even expected. Yeah, that's totally. The most thrilling part of this whole project is this is just a baseline. This is just a tool. Um, what we're starting to see from the community is all these different exploration ideas. Like people are going and just, just checking things out because they're curious, and that's really. That's really cool for us to see it kind of unlocking that curiosity. Yeah, totally. You guys built a, a great platform for people to, you know, take off from. You know, and it's great that it's open source. So uh, if I wanted to get into this, uh, what would a website be that I should go to? Oh, yeah. You can check us out at openrov.com. Um, and we're all open source and open hardware, so even if you want to build your own from scratch, you can get all our design details and build materials and stuff there. So check us out at openrov.com for sure. Awesome. And we have kits there too, so if you just want to get a kit and put that together, that's a great way to do it too. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. hey, cheers. That's a great project. I'll, I'll talk to you guys have soon. Fun. So we're going to talk with Roberto from Oru Kayak in just a second here. Yeah, so this is the, the Oru kayak. It's an origami kayak. Uh, the founder and designer Anton Willis uh, lived in Berkeley and didn't have enough space to store his kayak. So he was reading an article about origami one day and decided, hey, I bet I can build an origami kayak. So if you guys like, I can fold it up for you real quick. Yeah, sure. You want to tell us a little bit about how it was designed? Sure. While you do. It's uh, corrugated plastic, which allows it to fold and hold rigidity, which is really, really cool for a collapsible kayak. Yeah. Um, and it just has this one top seam, and everything else is a fold. So the way it's designed is, again, based on origami. So all of the folds are symmetrical all the way throughout the kayak. And this is the only seam in the boat, and we have this guy that seals it up right here. These orange parts give it rigidity. They're called bulkheads. Um, and then back here, this orange piece you see in the in the bottom here is going to become the case top and keep everything in it. Wow. So again, it's all identical in shape. It's just a matter of the sizes of these changing a little bit the way it lines up. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so where do you guys manufacture these? We're actually 100% California made. We manufacture down in Pomona, California, so near Riverside. Wow, very cool. Here in San Francisco, just around the corner, actually. Um, we're very excited about our new office. Okay. So here's the magic. So the here we go. Comes up, folds in on one side. That is so cool. And then we'll rotate for you guys. It just folds in on itself. And then voila, you have a cut case. So. That is so cool. So, um, if somebody were want, wanting to design a similar thing in terms of an origami style product, what kind of software stack would they use? You know anything about that? I really don't. No problem. No problem. I know that uh, Robert Lang has actually developed some really interesting software that's been used to uh, in heart stents and with the development of telescopes that go into the outer space, right? So, they're using those to really fold up the... The material is much smaller. Things like um, airbags actually use his origami algorithms, which are very, I, I, I believe they began very simple and have just become incredibly useful. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Robert Lang was one of the major inspirations for this. Um, so That's really cool. All right. Well, thanks for showing us. Sure. Thank you, guys. Nice, yeah. nice meeting you. Nice well. chatting with you. Yeah. I'm we sure we'll see you soon. Day. All right. Well, that's it for day one of Maker Camp. Uh, it's been amazing. Learned a lot from uh, everybody from Open ROV to Oru Kayak. Uh, thanks to the counselors. And yeah, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one.